truth can always be described. Many metaphysical treatises and some philosophical treatises deal with the outer world as though it were all illusion and the only reality a submergence in self, a sort of letting go of consciousness to attain a sense of complete selflessness. This sense of the absolute, however, has never been fully described and such failure has been laid to the inadequacy of the several hundred languages that are spoken by human beings. Truth must always be possible of description. Since it exists, it must be known. And when it is known, it can be described. All truth exists in some form, somewhere. This does not mean that all physical circumstance is truth, or both good and evil manifest themselves in the physical. But illusion, the only illusion that exists in this life or in the life of the spirit, is evil. Truth is reality, and reality can be described. Sin and punishment, cause and effect. Perhaps we are now better able to understand the ideas of sin and punishment. Sin is not a transgression against God or law in the sense of the violation of a moral code, nor is punishment a vengeance enacted by society or God upon the transgressor. Sin is simply error, and punishment is simply the inevitable result of error. If you are looking for a friend's house and you turn down the wrong street, you cannot expect to find your friend's house on that street. You have turned down the wrong street. Consequently, you will not find his house. Cause and effect, a law, that is all. So it is with all evil, which is error. That which you think good or evil will inevitably develop in your experience. If it is evil, it is error. And if it is error, the effect upon you must be evil. When you know that God is perfect, you will understand that God cannot err. And since evil is only error, God could not possibly be responsible for it. So evil is error and is illusion and is created by man in his search for truth by his thought conceptions being projected into the universal creative mind or universal subconscious mind. From the experience of evil, man chooses truth. In other words, he progresses by a system of trial and error. Each error carries with it its own consequences since we are dealing with a law of cause and effect. Therefore, the consequences of error are born on this earth. They are not born in a hereafter. Each soul returning into the subconscious mind from which it came returns without moral stigma, without judgment of any kind, without praise or blame, without reward or punishment. For we are all branches on one great tree which neither chastises itself nor destroys itself but simply contemplative and creative. I know, and this is why this, we have not, I have not understood why we have not learned this lesson of error with regard to what we are seeing in the world right now, with regard to the push for war by some beings, those that have perhaps convinced us that, well, I don't want to sidebar too much. There is a consequence to not learning the lessons of truth. Followers of certain religions which feature purgatory and damnation will now raise the point. Well, if the pure and the sinful are judged alike in the hereafter, what is the point of being good in our earthly lives? It seems highly objectionable to be restrained from the committing of evil simply because you wish to be rewarded with a harp in a nice cool place rather than a pitchfork in a very warm place. For this illusory promise of reward and punishment in the hereafter is a pale ghost alongside man's creative search for truth. You don't have to wait nearly so long as the doomsday to gain your punishment for evil. Steal your neighbor's purse and discover how soon your own is stolen from you. Kill your neighbor and discover how soon your own life is forfeit. That which you send out returns to you in this life, this now, this most important time that ever was, and it returns much sooner than you think. Remember this, remorsefulness is a sin against yourself. As a human being, you will make mistakes in arriving at truth. 
Do not allow remorse to become a prompter. Be joyful that error has disclosed truth. The tragic picture of man dragging through life, chastising himself for every mistake, making discouragement and shame his bedfellows, and even frightening himself into immobility through a hideous vision of punishment in hell is the source and cause of every prompter of the subconscious mind. To err is human. Evil is human. But evil is illusion, nothing more. It dissipates in front of good, almost magically. And every error in your life is for the purpose of revealing truth to you and not to stultify your divinity in shame and remorse and fear. There will be evil in the world until man completes his progress to a oneness with God. For there will be error until truth is known. You will make mistakes. You cannot live and not make mistakes, but you can, but this you can do. You can suffer the consequence of each mistake only once and no more. Let us face this very simple problem with the courage with which we are all naturally endowed. Let us not be afraid of making a mistake or of suffering a consequence if the mistake is made. If you have a desire, let it manifest. Don't keep telling the subconscious mind, do, don't, do, don't, until weary of its indecision on your shoulders, of moving back and forth, it lays the weight on, of its indecision on your shoulders with a burden no one in the world could bear. I say either do or don't, one or the other, for the subconscious mind is a vast army at your command, but it needs a clear-cut authoritative decision. What results then must be either truth or error. If it is truth, your whole life will be immediately bettered. If it is error, you will suffer a temporary punishment, a setback. But from the knowledge of truth thus gained, you have progressed. For this temporary setback, like the error that caused it, is simply illusion and is actually progress toward the realization of truth. Find a man who has suffered a score of defeat, and you will find a great soul. He may know more of truth than the man who has won a half dozen victories. The man with the half dozen victories knows a half dozen truths, while the man with a score of defeats may know 20 truths. Dare to be convinced. You must allow the subconscious mind to create your desires into actuality. If you desire money, let it be an assurance, a conviction that the law must resolve. Then without doubt, the money will be yours. This, of course, does not mean that the attaining of money is necessarily good. It may be, on the other hand, that the consequence of your having the money fills you with vanity and lust for power that lead you into isolation and worry and the automatic attraction of the destroyers of your happiness. Now, this is by no means axiomatic. A great many people have attained wealth, prospered with it, done a great deal of good with it, and have been far better off through making it. Yet there have been just as many people to whom the attainment of money has meant the dissolution of family, the destruction of health, and the complete disappearance of enjoyment of life and peace of mind. But if you want money, don't vacillate about it. Don't, on the one hand, complain that you do not have enough, and on the other, say that you don't care to have a lot. He saw, he saw, goes the subconscious mind, and exactly nothing happened. You must dare to be convinced on whatever it is that shapes up as a problem to you. Dare to make a decision. Take a side. Be convinced. Let that decision manifest itself in actuality. Then shirk neither from the reward nor punishment. For if you err, there is no one, nothing, that will hold you to account except the law of cause and effect, a strictly impersonal operating law. And once the consequence of the error has come upon you, you need have no fear that any others will be visited unless you create them yourself. For if you carry from some error, shame and remorse and chastisement, these must act on the subconscious mind to create themselves in reality. 
One bright day, a man starts out to open a business. At first, things progress favorably, but in the final consequence of wrong thinking, his business goes bankrupt. Wrong conception or error carries only one consequence. And the day this young man's business goes bankrupt, that consequence is brought home to him. But now is when he may make the greatest error of all. If he takes stock of what he has learned, discovers and recounts the errors in his thought, arrives at truth through examination of his error, then boldly strikes out once again. He is using the great powers of the universe as they must be used. And success will surely come to him. But if his error builds into shame and remorse and self-pity, he will suffer added consequences as long as he carries these illusions with him. For they will continue to develop in his life as long as he thinks them into the subconscious mind. Man makes circumstance. Now it must be thoroughly understood that we are not denying the existence of evil. We are simply denying the reality of evil, naming it illusion as it surely is. No great man or woman has ever lived who has not risen above circumstance, literally denying the reality of lack, limitation, illness, poverty, and inferiority. If you allow yourself to be a product of circumstance, then each encounter you make with evil will convince you of the reality of evil. And further, evil will be created in your experience. Moreover, you will make despair and fear and unhappiness your constant companions. Don't think for a single minute that circumstance makes the man. Man makes the circumstance. Through the great law of attraction, all things come to him who believes in them. And every circumstance of your life inevitably has been attracted to you by your own beliefs. You are literally a product of your own thought. You are what you think, only that, nothing more. You must right now convince yourself that evil is an effect, not a cause. Evil is the result of erroneous thought conception. Erroneous thought conception is the cause of evil. Evil is a circumstance, and you, as a divine part of the universal intelligence, need never be the result of circumstance. Do you get it? Do you see? Do you know who you are? You create the circumstance only when you believe the circumstance to be greater than you are. Will you allow it to continue to develop evil in your experience? Man-made law versus spiritual law. All moral and ethical laws are aimed at the general welfare of the human race as a whole. In other words, moral and ethical laws are designed as race preservatives. Since the first law of individuals or groups is self-preservation, there can be no doubt but what the evolution of all moral and ethical law is consistent with the spiritual laws of the universe. This, of course, does not mean that moral and ethical law shall not err, nor that they shall not on occasion promote evil. For all form, and man-made laws are no more than form, is but a temporal manifestation of thought and must change as thought changes. Consequently, we have the great evolution of human society from tribes of warring nomads to our gigantic cultures of today, where we dwell in relative peace with the main aim, creation rather than destruction. It is interesting to note that the plan of ethical and moral laws is essentially the same as the construction of the laws of the spirit. They are both designed as true law, simply cause and effect. Break a law of society and society will punish you for the transgression, by imprisonment, by ostracism, by financial penalty, by retracting certain rights within the group. Whatever evil circumstance the individual creates in his breaking of the law, the law attempts to visit on him in return. Though the original basis of this law was laid on considerations of moral and ethical right and wrong, once the law is broken, there is started a chain of events that moves without any consideration other than cause and effect and moves inexorably to its conclusion. Of course, because the laws of society are man-made, it sometimes happens that the lawbreaker escapes society's punishment for some time. Not so with the law of spirit. 
These laws work without the chance of error. And he who thinks evil creates evil. And he who sends out evil will find evil returning home once again. Moral law, therefore, is simply the effort of mankind to lay down rules of conduct which aim at eradicating error from society. Similarly, the laws of the spirit can be understood in such a manner and with such enlightenment as to eliminate error from the individual's life. The prompters at work. It is strange how often we recognize right from wrong and how often we follow in the path of wrong almost as if we desired evil. Scarcely a person lives who has not on some occasion performed some miserable act or deed in which he could not seem to help himself, as if some magnet lured him onward, as if in the performance of this wrong, he found a secret martyred delight. It has been convenient for society to propound that this only proves that the devil lives side by side with God and that evil is a thing in itself, a temptation tossed in the pathway of righteous and the sinner alike. Let us not be led astray by this type of abstruse thinking. God and the devil did not jointly author mankind. Obviously, one or the other did, since the possibility of their taking up such a joint enterprise defies all rationality. If the devil made man, then God could not exist in man, neither could good, and all would be evil. If the devil made man, then God could not exist in man, neither could good, and all would be evil. Since evil is error, all life would be error, and as a consequence, everything would be chaos, without design, without form. If God made man, then man is essentially good, but being free is likely to fall into error in his search for truth. If God made man, then man is essentially good, but being free is likely to fall into error in his search for truth. Isn't this mankind as we see it today? The devil is as illusory as evil. He does not exist in reality, neither do his fires. What men have always thought to be the work of the devil, we can, in this age, stay with certainty is little else than the remembrance by the subconscious mind of those pain experiences which have been rejected by the conscious mind. Once more, what men have always thought to be the work of the devil, we can in this age say with certainty, is little else than the remembrance by the subconscious mind of those pain experiences which have been rejected by the conscious mind. The power of the word. Perhaps from the previous chapter, you have been able to elicit sufficient understanding of the prompters that exist in your subconscious so as to make apparent the problem we are faced with now. The attraction of evil, limitation, lack, disease, poverty, etc., and a thousandfold more be laid to the insidious prompters and to any error honestly made in the search for truth. Today, you may be walking around with a subconscious full of prompters that would have you be sick. What have you be poor? What have you be lonely and unsuccessful? You must control these prompters or they will control you. You must, by conscious meditation on the spiritual laws of the universe, install in the subconscious a conditioned response for good, which will automatically displace all negative prompters. You must do this or there is not the slightest possibility of the full and good life. You cannot expect evil without creating evil. After having performed meditation, there is no longer can be any doubt in your mind, but what speaking the word means, activating some power to create the conditions you desire. The word or the thought, since time immemorial, has been the first step in all creation, all achievement, all desire. The power of the word or thought, is such that nothing will stand against it as long as it is spoken with conviction. The subconscious mind is a brilliant deductive reasoner. In fact, there is valid reason to assume that deductively the subconscious mind reasons perfectly. 
Given a premise like, I will make money, it can reduce a series of brilliantly logical steps for the accomplishment of the same. For example, under deep hypnosis, a patient was informed that he was in discussion with Plato. And from the subsequent discussion, there evolved the most beautiful philosophical premises imaginable, as if they came directly from the mouth of the master himself. This discourse was far above the normal intelligence of the patient, and witnesses for some time believed that this young man had actually contacted the spirit of Plato. Everyone is prone to attribute all things beyond his immediate understanding to the realm of ghosts and banshees and shades and shadows. But let there be no doubt. The subconscious mind has as its resources all the knowledge and wisdom there is. And all occultism is simply the use of the mind in which we all live and move and have our being. You are never alone. In view of this intense discussion on evil and good, and their creation in individual lives. You may be regarding this, the conflict between them, as a battle, necessitating your most valiant effort. In other words, a great weight of tremendous effort may be settling on your shoulders as you think of the eternal sentinel you must stand at the bastions of your conscious mind to prevent the entrance of the forces of negative thinking. Similarly, since we are human, and must err occasionally. You may be regarding future error with fear, thinking with indecision over courses of action. Let us dispel this thought once and for all. Let us first dispel it by assuring you that you are never alone. Responsibility for your slightest action never rests solely upon you. Were it up to you all by yourself, you couldn't walk across the street, speak to a friend, or even be in existence. Mark this fact well. You didn't create yourself. You cannot, by yourself, do the slightest bit of creating. The power into which you project your thoughts is the only creative force there is, and it builds and constructs all form and circumstance. But it does this according to how you think. Accept, don't will. Now it is absolutely impossible for you to make this power do anything. You cannot by sheer force of will bend this power to suit your needs. You are not greater than God. You cannot either stop or start this power in its creating for it is greater than you are and it moves according to law. You cannot say, I am going to make money with all the determination and ferociousness you can muster and expect that you are creating your experience anything other than belligerence and opposition. You've got to accept, not demand. You can't will anything. This does not mean a doctrine of resignation. Far from it. It simply means that you recognize that it is not you who does the creating. It is a power greater than you are. This power creates what you believe and manifests to you what you are prepared to accept. Be sure you understand this. All your will for money will avail you nothing, for that is the wrong use of spiritual law. Money will be created in your experience only if you realize and know that there is abundance all about you, and you accept it. In other words, you don't demand money. You don't force money with the idea that there's not enough to go around and you don't have enough of it. You accept money. There is a great abundance of it about you, and you know that therein lies the true use of spiritual law. As against the isolated exercising of the individual's will. For the force of your will against the universal mind must inevitably set up that same thing in your experience so that you see opposition instead of cooperation. Expect and accept. Know and experience. Be positive and thankful for the great laws of attraction and creation are laws of attunement and never divulge their secrets to those who batter at the door with force. 
Who has not seen a child completely accepting all good with an open heart and knowing this? Only the don't we fear condition adults impose on this godlike young mind. Ever set up, conditioned, can'ts, impossibles, lack and limitation. But the child accepts all good as a natural course of events, depends completely on all good being directed to it simply because of its desire. Accept, know, and accept. Those are the secrets of all prayer and manifestation. Guidance through attunement. It is important for you to know that even with the thought, even with thought, the entire responsibility need not rest with you. The power that creates is the power that knows. And it is possible with perfect attunement to achieve in each condition of your life a situation of guidance. Now, you cannot achieve attunement or guidance when you are consciously willing something to happen. The very idea of your will being imposed upon that of God's is indefensible from any kind of view. When you have completely accepted the power greater than you are, when you know it will create in your experience that which you believe, you will also find that it will also provide you with answers to your questions. You must do this by letting go of your problem. Once the basic elements of the problem are clearly defined in your conscious mind, and once your general objective is clearly defined in your conscious mind, let go. Forget the problem altogether. One morning, while you are going about your daily task, you will find the answer. It will strike your consciousness with such an impact as to remove all doubt But what is truth. The answer will be crystal clear of such simplicity that you will be amazed that it never occurred to you before or that you ever held any doubt about it. This is guidance. It is not achieved by any effort or will. It is achieved by confidence in the power greater than you are. It is achieved by complete acceptance of the power greater than you are. If you are able to effect this complete attunement every minute of every day of your life, there can be little doubt, but what pain and lack and limitation and disease will never more exist in your experience. But we must caution you against raising your expectancies higher than your faith. If you say to yourself in the morning, I know I am working along the paths of success and go the rest of your day complaining about every obstacle you meet, you may wind up the week expecting that success should be yours, but it won't be. Your faith must be with you at least 51% of the time before it will manifest in your experience. But a manifestation will come one way or the other according to the predominant thought. Brief review now. Here are the points to remember in chapter two. One. Evil is error and illusion. Two, good is truth and reality. Three, truth will dispel error. Therefore, good will dispel evil. Four, evil is the result of man's thought, not God's. Five, Hell and devil are illusions. Six, God does not destroy any human soul. He does not destroy himself. Seven, God knows everything, therefore is incapable of error or evil. Eight, the single function of the subconscious mind or universal mind is to manifest into form or circumstance, the seed of thought. Nine, man has complete freedom of choice in the kind of thoughts he wishes to plant in the garden, the subconscious mind. 10, no human being can assume the responsibility for a single thing other than his own thinking. For the universal subconscious mind, does all creating. 
11. Morality and ethics do not always follow the law of cause and effect, but the use of spiritual law always follows the law of cause and effect. This is because moral law is man-made, while spiritual law is the essence of God. 12. The proper use of spiritual law is acceptance and faith. 13. You cannot demand anything from the universal subconscious mind by willing it to happen. 14. Guidance and inspiration in the paths of truth and achievement can be yours through faith and reliance in the power greater than you are. Strive for balance. You are now experimenting with the greatest force in nature. We caution you not to become so wrapped up in it that you forget your daily life. Do not search for, for contact with the subconscious mind to the exclusion of the exercise of the conscious mind. For as a human being, your goal must be to achieve a perfect balance between the two. The ordinary people we meet each day scarcely use the subconscious mind at all, and their lives are directed and controlled entirely by circumstance. Men and women of genius are those in whom there is a perfect balance between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. It is the balance we strive for, balance between the great creative power of the universal subconscious mind and the conscious mind. Work at your meditation joyfully and confidently. Cast aside all doubt and morbidity and effort and strain. You don't have to make anything. It is already made. You only want to use it correctly. Accept. Believe. Know. Relax. The universe will provide you with all you desire. An experiment, experience with telepathy. As an interesting experiment with the power you are dealing with, gather a few friends together and conduct a session of telepathy. Join hands in a circle after one member of the circle has been blindfolded. In the center of the circle, place a pack of playing cards. At a given signal, expose one of the cards to the sight of all members of the circle, except the person who wears the blindfold. Be careful to expose only one card. Have all members of the circle concentrate on the exposed card and instruct the blindfolded person to report the card uppermost in his mind as soon as he has a clear picture of it. Let every member of the circle wear the blindfold in turn. Your result won't be perfect, but will prove to you beyond any doubt that there is a mind or ether or medium in which we all live and move and have our beings and through which we may contact each other through nothing but thought. This is the universal subconscious mind. The meditation. Our meditation following this chapter is aimed at dispelling illusion or evil. When you have settled yourself for your meditation, recall to mind all those circumstances in your life which you consider to be error or evil. Say to yourself that they are simply illusion and do not exist in reality. Then commence with your meditation. Within a month, you will see some very startling changes. In later chapters, we shall become more and more specific with our meditations until one by one, we have laid each ghost and demon that springs from the buried prompters in your subconscious until your life opens to unlimited horizons and great adventure until you see the universe as it really is designed specifically for you. No, accept. Believe. Keep faith. There are more things in this world than you have ever dreamed. The recommended reading for this chapter is Creative Mind by Ernest Holmes, published by Robert M. McBride and Company. Second Meditation I know that I am one with the universal mind. I know this mind is perfect and I may rely upon it for complete guidance in all of my daily affairs. This universal mind, this great subconscious mind, this mind of God knows no evil or limitation or lack. 
It simply creates, in my experience, that which I believe and accept. Therefore, I deny all evil and all error. When my eyes and my senses are deluded with the apparent circumstance of evil, I turn away, lifting my thoughts to the perfection and abundance and love of all the universe. I know that God does not create evil, and I know that by using the power of God, I am able to deny evil, which is only illusion, simply error, and will not stand before truth. For the great reality is good, which is always attempting to manifest itself. I know that error or evil is the result of my own thought, is the result of error on my part, is the result of isolating myself from the power of the universal mind. I know that the universal mind is constantly creating, in my experience, that which I think. And if evil is manifested, it has come from my own thought. And my own thought may as quickly deny it. I do not will anything to happen, for I am not bigger than God. I simply understand that the law of creation is bigger than I am, and that I cannot help my thoughts and beliefs from becoming real in my experience. Therefore, I hold my thoughts steadfastly on the good. I do not do this with effort, as if I were commanding something to act. I simply relax in contemplation of the good, secure in the knowledge that everything rests with a power much greater than I am. I trust this power. I have complete faith and confidence in this power. I rely upon this power for guidance in all my daily affairs. I refuse to accept evil, and evil is gone. I accept good, and the supply and love of the universe are mine. So that is chapter two, quite a long chapter, and I will serve it in sections for ease of listening and reflection points. I would encourage you to listen again and to contemplate what is being said here. I would encourage you to not react to the inculcation we have all received about what is good and what is evil and where it comes from, but rather hear, really hear by getting still and quiet and going within to that still quiet place where you hear the still small voice of the divine it will help you relax and understand the message of power in this particular chapter called illusion. It's so powerful when you get the realization and the understanding. So may it be well with you. May you contemplate and reflect deeply. May you be open. And as the chapter reminds us, may you accept the one presence and one power that is God, that is good, that is all in this universe. And until I see you again, keep your thoughts high, keep your emotions in check, align, align, align with the power of good in your life. And all is well in your world. But for now, goodbye.